All over Britain, there are archaeological sites that are too dangerous to access or excavate. They could contain unique and valuable evidence of our past, which if not investigated, will be lost forever. EXA is a team of highly skilled archaeologists. Katie Hurst, in charge of excavation. Alice Roberts, doctor and expert in human bones. Meg Waters, geophysicist and digital imaging specialist. All experts in their chosen fields who are determined to get into these inhospitable places to forensically assess, survey and extract the evidence. The expedition leader will be me, Mark Davis, volcanologist, climber, caver and diver. This is archaeology on the very edge. This week we are all hanging around in Pembrokeshire trying to excavate three ancient burials before they fall out of the cliff and are lost forever. This is the beautiful Pembrokeshire Coastal Path that stretches for 200 miles around southwest Wales. But parts of the pathway are in imminent danger of being destroyed due to coastal erosion and subsequent landslides. Take this section, over the last few years alone, it's lost several metres to the advancing sea. But in the process of falling away, three small stone-lined coffins have emerged from the cliff face. So EXA has been called in to rescue the archaeology and investigate this site before it's lost to us all forever. This site was discovered by a Pembrokeshire National Park ranger who was monitoring the coastal erosion through binoculars when he spotted the stone coffins. Because the coastal path is walked by thousands every year, it's hugely important to maintain and preserve this fragile natural resource. To that end, the seaward edge of the path has been designated an area of special scientific interest, a triple SI. We've come here at the beginning of winter to minimize our impact on the environment, working in close collaboration with the park rangers. Do we know anything at all about this site? Well, the only things we really are sure about are that there's two Iron Age hill forts on either side of us, one over there and one over there. So what we might be looking at is an Iron Age cemetery, but it just seems a bit odd that there are all these stones sticking out of the cliff face as well, because they didn't tend to bury their dead in stone-lined coffins. So who used to bury their dead in stone-lined coffins? I guess that's the first question. Well, well they used to do it in the Bronze Age. Romans Bronze did it as well. Um, but also the 6th century as well, around here. We've got just three coffins there, Meg. Have you thought about the geophysics? <clears throat> Absolutely. I think um, I'm going to use radar first, and I'm going to drag it right along the top of this cliff edge here, right over what we think are the targets, so, so that I can see, one, if radar is going to work, and two, get a good depth estimate what it's going to look like or what they should look like. And then I'm going to continue surveying back from the cliff edge to try to see if we have other features that look the same that we can maybe target later. I'll and give us an they... idea of whether it's a cemetery yeah, or not yeah, as well. Yeah, then, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I think we need to clean up this whole section along here and actually assess how many graves there are, where they are, and uh, what they're looking like as well. Yeah. Yeah. I'm really excited about this because we, I don't think we're going to get an awful lot of evidence sort of looking at the cliff here because we can't sort of excavate into it because this is a triple SI, so we can't undercut this, this, this edge. That's right. But if Meg finds some more burials further back, then there's a possibility of excavating a whole burial, and that's where we'll get some really Lab. good information. Yeah. The fragments of stone eroding out of the cliff face are the remnants of stone-lined coffins. Constructed of sandstone slabs, they were assembled to form a lidded coffin, a stone box with no bottom. Before we can examine the cliff face, Meg is going to conduct a geophysical survey on the path itself directly above the eroding coffins. I'm going to start with ground penetrating radar because I've had really good success in the past finding graves and burials with, with radar. I'm really excited because I'm going to do time slicing. I put it in a cube of data and then start slicing down because what we'll be able to see is if there are more than just a few burials, we'll see the distribution across the area. We'll be able to come out and, and literally peg it out on the ground where these burials are. 
and I can also see depth-wise where they are. So we can actually, in the cube, have a three-dimensional image of where the features are and then go investigate them. So, yeah, it's going to be good. <laughs> Very excited. Three coffins eroding out of the cliff face doesn't necessarily mean we've got a cemetery. They could be an isolated single-family plot. Part of Meg's task is to find evidence of more burials. But first, she's got to find out what these stone-lined boxes look like on her radar. The radar signature is essential to identify key features of the site. The position of our burials in this tiny bay, flanked by two as yet unexcavated Iron Age forts, is an archaeologist's blank canvas as far as dates are concerned. We can eliminate most of prehistory from our inquiries. In Bronze Age Wales, they tended to bury their dead in barrows. In the Iron Age, they were cremated. The Romans didn't even get to within 30 miles of here, so that rules them out. And by the medieval period, the dead were buried in the parish churchyard of St Ishmael's, two miles inland. So that leaves what we used to call the Dark Ages, or now, more properly, the early medieval period. That's a good... How's it looking? Um, yeah, I think we have a target that's just underneath the beginning corner of our grid. So, so you think it might be a stone? Yeah, I do, because a... it's very flat and it's a very strong reflector. Flat meaning it's just very straight in the, in the data. It doesn't, doesn't have any dipping angles or anything. Right. So. Only accessible at low tide, the beach below our site is where I caught up with a very reverend Wynne Evans, Dean of St David's Cathedral and archaeologist who is convinced that what we've got here is indeed a cemetery, the last resting place of a group of early Christians. It'll be fascinating to see who was buried in the cemetery. If they're all males, fairly, fairly young, and um, perhaps with uh, a rather skimpy diet, you might think that they were um, ascetic monks. Or on the other hand, of course, it might be the cemetery of a community. Um, and that in itself is fascinating because these people may have been Christians, they may have, have not. They may have been a church of sorts attached to that uh, particular cemetery, or they may not. Because in the beginning, what you get appear to be open cemeteries based on family groups, um, which either attract a chapel to them, or in about the 8th or the 9th century, or slightly later, they're abandoned and people start burying in churches. If Wynne is correct, this could date the burials to as early as the 6th century, the so-called Age of Saints, when most of the population was being converted to Christianity. It's time for Alice and Katie to have a closer look at the eroding burials. The initial assessment is crucial. Firstly, to see exactly what state the archaeology is in, and secondly, to work out an excavation strategy. Anything with all the bits flying around, Alice. Um, I've got this big slab here sticking out. I can't see anything that looks like any bone though sticking out of the sea. Uh, hang on a minute. I think I've got a bit of bone here. Yeah, that is definitely bone. It looks like skull. It's, it's incredible here at the moment. The whole of the cliff is all sandstone. So what's happening is the sand is just blasting us off and we can't even look over the edge, so conditions working there are pretty impossible at the moment. With the team being sandblasted and buffeted against the cliff face, it's clear that we're going to have to think of another way yeah, of doing really? this. Yeah. It's easy to see how the archaeology is being so quickly destroyed, but it's not all bad news. But it's looking really promising, you actually see voids. Uh, yeah. Underneath the, underneath actually the within, within the coffins? Yeah, yeah. Oh, and, fantastic. and bone as well. So there are bones there? Yeah, definitely. Safely extracting the bones is going to be critical if we're going to find out who was buried here. After a day of being buffeted and sandblasted, the delivery team has come up with a new plan to get us to work on the cliff face. A platform is to be suspended over the edge, big enough for Katie and Alice to work on and stable enough not to be blown about in the gales. But Alice is concerned that when it's lowered, yeah. it will crash into the archaeology. Beam, you know where the stones are, don't you? You really try not to knock them as you lower the thing, as you lower the platform. The other option is to have 
someone on the beach with a rope tied onto it, holding onto it. What's going to happen is that Trev's going to tie a rope to the platform. Um, he's going to go down on the beach and he's going to pull it so the platform will be away from the cliff and then let to rest against the cliff when it's gone down low enough. With the platform safely secured, Katie and Alice, this time wearing safety goggles, begin the dusty process of clearing the cliff face of loose vegetation. There could be more stone coffins hiding in the undergrowth. Back up top, Megs extended her survey area 10 metres inland, on the edge of a conifer plantation, and there appears to be archaeology everywhere. This looks really nice. That is fantastic. Jim, something really good right there. Really good. Can you pull a little bit more? See, that's exactly what we're looking for. Perfect. Really nice. OK, good. Thanks, Jim. So what radar actually picks up is the contrast between dielectric properties. So if you've got something, say, stone, a certain property and soil around it. Now there's going to be more air mixed in with the soil, but what we're going to get is that interface between the soil and the stone, and then that's what we actually get this response from, is, is part of the radar wave as it goes in the ground, part of it reflects off of that surface and comes back up, and part of it continues ah, down right. into the ground. That's yeah. why we yeah. can go vertically. Yeah. What is a big challenge here is all these trees that are planted, oh, yeah. right? So yeah. they've been digging holes. Yes and putting trees in. And what we see now are there are a bunch of little baby trees, but if other trees have been planted and dug up and taken out yeah. and trees put back in, and, you know, so if we have all these holes being excavated, it's, it's not easy to detect the difference between a tree hole and, say, a burial. Yeah. It's finally time for me to get up close and personal with the archaeology. That's assuming the platform can take my weight. I'm doing all right. <laughs> so what we got then? Tell, tell me what we got. I think you're really good. Start right. with your furthest one away. That's You see that one right in front of you? This one here? Yeah, that's looking good. What's that? That's a bit of bone. That's, that's that is a bit of bone. Yes. So there's a, there's How... a bit down there and there's a bit across there. Really? <laughs> Do you know, I, I would never in a million years would I would I see that as, as being bone. It looks like a, a fleck of uh, some sort of flint or whatever, isn't it? I mean, yeah. that's incredible. So what about then, this? This is, that's a fantastic one. That's great, isn't it? That this, is brilliant. This one, you can see you've got another vertical stone here. Yeah. You've got horizontal slabs going across and then another vertical. Yeah. So it, it's beginning to look like all these coffins are going off in that kind of direction. Yeah, not, yeah. Not straight on, but just slightly sloping and th off in but that, that direction. But that kind of says, no, it does. It says east-west, doesn't it? Yeah. So, so that's, that's kind of right, isn't it? Yeah. The east-west alignments of the burials is further evidence that this is a Christian site, a relic of earlier pagan times, when burials were aligned to the rising and setting sun. Early Christians were buried east-west to be ready for Judgment Day and the resurrection. OK, Katie, I've, I've photographed that, that fragment now, which it looks like it's going to fall off, so I'm going to take it off and okay, yeah, stick it in a bag. I think, I think the other bit I'll leave there, because that's fairly embedded. It's time to get the fragment back to the dome for analysis. Alice, have you found out what those fragments of bone are yet? Yes, it's definitely a skull and it's definitely human, which is obviously what we're interested in. Yeah. The texture of it really sort of gives it away. Um, can you see that it's got a sort of honeycomb middle to it? Yeah. Um, which is called a diploe, and that's okay. where the marrow is inside the skull. Yeah. And then there's a slightly sort of um, thicker table of bone on either side of that, and that's the classic construction of the vault bones of the skull. Okay. So it's not just it's not just a skull bone. It's actually we can say quite specifically where in the skull it's from. It's part of this area. Yeah. And what's really nice actually is that on this piece here, we've actually got some of the grooves. You can see it here. I've got it underneath the microscope. Can you see these oh, grooves? Oh, I can see a groove. Them? Yeah. Yeah. And they sort of branch well. yeah. out. It's actually little arteries. Arteries. Yeah. 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 Okay. And yeah. they make they actually make grooves where they lie up against the bone, and that is a meningeal artery groove on Fantastic. the inside of the skull. I mean, I'm I'm absolutely amazed that you're able to tell from from that all that information. It's fantastic. Having said that, right. that's information which is general. Do you know what I mean? That's, yeah. that's any human skull. We still don't have any idea of how old this person is, what sex they were, mm. all of this sort of thing. So, um, 
you know, there, there's a lot you can say from these tiny little pieces, but you can't really tell much about the person. So for you, we need to find a complete burial. That's what you would like. Well, that would be lovely. Yeah. yeah. Discover the past with exclusive ancient history documentaries and ad-free podcasts presented by world-renowned historians from History Hit. Watch them on your smart TV or on the go with your mobile device. Download the app now to explore everything from the wonders of Pompeii to the rebellion of Boudicca and the mysteries of prehistoric Scotland. Immerse yourself in the captivating stories of this remarkable era by signing up via the link in the description. Back on site, there are fragments of bone eroding out everywhere. They all need to be recorded, then removed or they'd be lost forever. Alice, is this part of the skull that you found yesterday? Yes, it is. Um, this is part of the, the side of a skull. I showed you these smaller fragments yesterday, and this is a much bigger fragment. Um, and this is the inside again with those channels for the blood vessels. Right. Um, oh, so you can see it quite clear. Yeah, you can see the curve of it as well. Yeah, can't, it's yeah. Cr incredibly fragile, isn't it? Really wafer thin it almost. It is, yeah. yeah. It's very crumbly, so we're going to have to get that out very carefully. Yeah, yeah. It looks as though most of the rest of the skull has already been lost to erosion. Yeah. Have you found anything else in the other? Because this is yeah. clearly one grave here, and that's quite a big one there. Have you found anything else there? Um, this one over here? Yeah, there's a bit of bit of skull here, a curve that you can just see in cross-section. Yeah, yeah. Can you see that there? Yeah. It's just sliced through it. Oh, yeah. Um, and then that's a vertebra. This is really nice, though, because this gives us a definite orientation on the graves. Yeah. It shows us that the head is up at this end, and if that's a vertebra, then the spine's obviously heading down that way. So we are getting this sort of orientation. East-west orientation. Yeah, yeah, the yeah, face. yeah. In the dome, Meg's processed all her radar survey from yesterday. But has it given us any new excavation targets? So what I see here is if I, in this cube, if I turn it so it actually looks like a plan view, it's, yeah, it's easier to see things. You can things. see that great. You can yeah. absolutely yeah. see straight lines and corners. Yeah. And it's this feature right here. Do you think that that's pro possibly a coffin? I, that, that's quite wide, isn't it? I don't know if it's a coffin or if it's a stone perimeter. Yeah. You know, the edges of something. It doesn't appear to be, to me, like a slab covering something because I would expect that to be just a complete bright reflector at this level. Yeah. So I'm, I'm really not sure. I would excavate right there, though. Okay, so that's, so that's the that's target, target you number want. One. Target number one. Meg's feature on the radar survey is four meters by two. Too big to be one burial, and too big for one trench. It's positioned right in the middle of the coastal path. We don't want to destabilize the cliff edge more than necessary, so we're open a one by two to try and prove that Meg's radar signatures are indeed burials. I've been enlisted to help out topside, though I suspect more for my brawn than my brain. Oh. How have you got on? Um, well, I've cleared that whole sort of area that we're looking at with all the undergrowth. There's nothing there. No more. No more coffins. No, no more there's a side to the coffin that you found yesterday with yeah. the with the skull section in it, um, but apart from that, no. What's that looking like inside it? Is it just the skull, or I haven't cleaned it things? anymore because right. um, I think we need to we need to plan it all, don't we first? Yeah, it looks as though, doesn't it, that the, the all we've got are the skulls and the feet that I think have the sort of gone, gone off in gone. that direction yeah. have, have dropped out. Yeah. So this is the very you know the last bit of evidence that yeah. is there to get. So I think it probably would be a good idea to take those out. Part of our job here is to find the extent of the burials. And if this is an early Christian site, any traces of a church, the aerial photographs may hold some clues. I think what's really interesting that's come up from using the GIS is looking at the aerial photograph. There's a number of features which we can kind of see. Yeah, yeah, there's definitely something in there, isn't there? It's sort of rectilinear. That's great, because you can't see that on the ground at all. I no, mean, there's, there's, I mean, there's nothing there at all. This is a big feature. I mean, if we actually just measure up from there, this is sort of 23 metres um, across there and then extends sort of 49 metres down behind the trench. That's quite true. Yeah. And then within that, you've got this smaller circular feature. Yeah. And that's, that's about 12 metres in diameter. What we need to do is, is try and find out whether that is associated with our grave. Mm. So I guess the thing to do is um, get Meg to survey over that area. The corner of the rectangular feature is inland of the coastal path, in the field alongside our dome. It could be a banked or fenced enclosure around a cemetery, 
but our burials are outside of it. I need to get a second and third opinion about what this thing could be. What we can see clearly here is this, this return here. That's, uh -huh. that's the clearest, most defined um, feature that we've got on this aerial photograph. Yeah. Normally, I suppose, you look at that kind of circular feature and think Iron Age and think house. If you see something rectilinear like that, you either think it's, it's modern or you might think it's Roman. There are loads of possibilities here, and what we've got to be careful not to do is prejudge it. Context is all in archaeology, you know, yeah. and you've got to work out whether this circular feature is in some sort of context with the, this Absolutely. possible enclosure yeah. and is that in some sort of context with the burials. Okay. That, that's yes. your... Yes. And you've got to work out the extent of it. Is, is this enclosure the extent of the, the archaeology right. here? Meg's got every toy out of the GFIS toy box to try and give us a target to dig on this feature. But after four hours of radar, resistivity and magnetometry, she's less than impressed with the results. We're really targeting that particular corner so, because you can see it the best in the so photo. That looks like a linear feature to me. It does. It does. It does. It does indeed look like a, a linear feature. But then so does this. Mm. And we've got a little bit of a pattern here. And you've got to wonder if it isn't geological in nature. Instead of a corner, our corner being like this in the data, we've got something that's oriented like this. <sighs> yeah. Which is completely off, you know, just completely opposite. Well, it's a real danger, isn't it, looking at this and seeing these features and thinking we've got archaeology. Absolutely. And, and it really isn't archaeology. Yeah. Um, it's too big a risk. To tie up time and resources on something so archaeologically indistinct that it could be geology. With no chance of extending a survey into the conifer plantation, Meg's going to concentrate their efforts into giving us one final dig in target, near the cliff edge. Katie's trench is well advanced. She seems to be coming down on stonework, which may be the first signs of a stone-lined grave. Ooh. Ooh, I saw that. Ooh. Well, this is starting to look really good. We've got um, vertical-looking stone here yeah. and another flat one here so this this looks that's probably the top of a grave this looks just the like side the of it coming the down cliff, yeah. Yeah. yeah and look at this big void going down onto there oh, yeah well some of the ones in the cliff side have actually got voids underneath the the top slabs yeah. quite a few of them yeah looks like we've just come we've just clipped it in the, right in the corner of course of course and of course <laughs> it looks like there's another one over here you see that's very high up though, isn't it? It is high, but look look at the colour of the soil, it's very dark. Oh, it's completely different, yeah. yeah. So that to me looks so it's possibly the end of a the end of the grave and it's possibly nice. going off in that direction. Yeah. Oh, it's just so annoying though, it always happens in the corner. Typical, isn't it? <laughs> I'm just beginning to wonder whether Meg's Jeffis survey was actually showing not a, a rectangle in the middle, but actually graves on either side. I thought this last night when I looked at it, when she was saying there was this rectangular shape yeah. that was four metres by two metres, I was saying, well, could it not be two graves in a row making that four metres? Yeah. And then a gap and then another one. Probably what's happened. Yeah. But this is great. This, and, is, this is fantastic. And uh, if this is the top, then hopefully it's going to be really well preserved as well underneath. I think we're going to have to extend the trench, which means moving back all that spoil. Under the spoil heap. <laughs> Before we can find out if this is an intact burial, we're going to have to shift four tonnes of soil. The grave could provide all of the answers we've been searching for, the age and sex of the long-dead occupant. What started with a park ranger viewing a grave through a pair of binoculars in a cliff face has turned into an incredibly complex site. The grave is part of a cemetery. We don't know what age as yet. The geophysical survey is turning up hot spots all over the place, so it's easy for us to get carried away with a gem of a place like this. And we mustn't forget our original specific objective, and that's rescue archaeology. So Alice is going to go back over the cliff 
and continue to document it further northwards, see if she can see more graves. Katie's going to extend her trench a little bit, see if she can come down on top of a complete burial. And Meg's going to reaffirm some of her geophysical interpretation. So it's our last morning. I wish we had a month of them. Yeah. Alice, what's left to do on the um, cliff face? Um, well, Jim and I have planned half of it from the platform yesterday, and mm. we've just got the other two graves to plan. There are four graves down there, sticking yeah. out of the cliff. You've seen them really nicely now. Um, and we have um, rescued all the bits of bone that were falling out of the cliff. They're pretty fragmentary, though. Um, tiny little bits of cranium that can't really give you much of a clue as to who that person was that was buried. Right. Um, so I've got good hopes for, for these trenches up here and hopefully we'll get some, we'll get some better um, bone specimens out. Wait, but they're good enough for a C14 date at the moment? Absolutely. Oh, that's all right. Yeah. Meg spent most of yesterday trying to locate a mysterious rectangle in the adjacent field. Today, she swapped her radar for a matter. The primary goal of, of, of our work here is, is to establish what's going on with these burials that are eroding out of the sure. cliff edge. Yeah. But what I was interested in is this spot right here that looks the same, mm -hmm. but actually is back a bit, almost 10 metres from the cliff edge, to see if the cemetery would actually go back at all and not all be eroded out. OK. And if you come down on top of something then, I guess you could infer other areas within your mm -hmm, GPR? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's all trying to classify things so that we don't have to excavate the whole area. If we have a number of spots that we can say, all right, we excavated over two, three of these spots, they are in fact burials. Let's assume then that, that this signature in the radar data is, is probably, not definitely, but probably a burial. It's important to find out if these signatures are burials, but with only six hours of daylight left, it's going to be a tall order. To compound our time problem, Katie's uncovered another stone-lined grave in a trench. Yeah. So this is, this is probably a later grave. It's a really nicely built structure. They've got these horizontal slabs and vertical slabs. So yeah. I think they've taken a lot of care if they're dead. Sure. Yeah. So what's the plan of action now? Well, I'm extending this all the way back here to reveal this grave. And we're going to un uncover the stones, reveal the skeleton. Alice can have a look at it, we'll record it all properly, lift it, and then go down onto the skeleton. So that means shifting all that stuff? Yeah, it's a hell of a lot of work to do in one day. With all of the evidence pointing to an early Christian cemetery, Wynne suggested that he and I went to church. St Ishmael's was once the centre of a thriving medieval community. The church itself dating from the 11th century. Though much modernised through the ages, it contains relics from a time before the church and its cemetery came into existence. A fine collection of early Christian crosses. Um, this clearly is broken because the top of the head of the, of the cross has gone. You can just about see where it's going to, um, to move up. Now, what are they doing? What are they for? They're either gravestones or they can be used as boundary markers. In other words, when you came into the church's land, yeah. The, this cross would mark the, the division, as it were. And that was important. If you were a fugitive seeking sanctuary, um, in the case of some of these major Welsh churches, the, the sanctuary area can be as much as 3,000 acres. Because <laughs> you can come in there with your retinue, with your army, with your family, with your uh, flocks and herds, and yeah. if you had yeah. to have a space, and you had to know where the boundary was. In, in the, the future, future, yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah. If you just go behind the font and bring that, that small one. one. The small one? Uh, yeah. yeah. It's quite heavy, one. This could be a grave marker, right, rather than um, um, a cross. In other words, the sort of sites we are looking at on the cliffs, which are at, at, in any sense is at the opposite end of this. This is a major um, clerically staffed uh, mother church, Episcopal church perhaps, was perhaps of the 9th, 10th and um, 11th centuries. The site on the cliff is the precursor to this. Okay. Um, and an early Christian community with, an, say, an open cemetery who hadn't thought at that point of, of creating a church and moving into, um, into a churchyard for a churchyard burial. Yeah. Their graves might have been marked by things like, like this, this. yes. Yeah. Do you think we'd find something like this on our site? I think this is slightly later, but this is the kind of thing we would be looking for. Sure. Not maybe even as big as this, and not with, with a cross, but a much simpler ring cross, yeah. and maybe a small inscription. It's obvious that there are no upstanding grave markers on our site, Ooh, yes, though they may have fallen over and been buried by the passage of hundreds yeah. of years. 
That's exactly the kind of stuff that you should be looking for, certainly, because okay. that's what I've got in that trench. Uh -huh, uh -huh. So when they cut the grave, they would have taken out the fill okay. and then just put it straight back in. Mm. So the difference in the soil colour is, is going to be really hard yeah, to see. Yeah, yeah. So, All right. But I think, no, I think you're, you're on something there. Good? Excellent. With Katie's trench enlarged, the full extent of the new tiny grave is revealed. The grave's a lot smaller than what we first thought. Yeah, and can you guess what's going to be in this kind of size grave? Yeah. It's going to be a little baby. Yeah. 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 It's always really sad, I think, digging up, digging up babies. But it, it kind of brings to home as well that there must have been a much higher infant, infant mortality rate you know, in, in the past yeah. than there is today. So are we going to go about excavating this then? Well, it'll be the same process that I use all the time. You take the last thing off first. So I'm going to have to just start peeling back all these stones. And then I'll probably come onto the soil that they put over the skeleton. We'll remove the soil and then probably come down onto the skeleton. OK. All right. All right. So yeah. the other thing that we have to look out for when we're lifting these stones is for any engravings on the other side, because that quite often happens. So sure, OK. Just keep an eye out for that. It's, it's strange. I, I, I honestly yeah. thought that I'd be really excited, but um, it's really sombre, mm. you know? Yeah. And, it's, and uh, it's kind of um, even sadder the way they've taken so much care with the burial as well, haven't they? They've yeah. really, obviously, really... How do you actually... Um, how do you cope personally with that? Well, I, I have to say that you just cut yourself off from it and, um, you know, you have to just think that what you're doing is for our knowledge now. You yeah. know, what, what we find out about this baby is all going to add to the, our knowledge of the past. Right. So... Um, the only thing that I'm shoving to, to the forefront of my head at the moment is the fact that in 20 years' time, this is not going to be here anyway. I well, mean, exactly. we, we are rescuing it. Exactly. If, if we weren't here digging this, then all this information would be completely lost anyway. Yeah. Alice is taking one last trip over the edge, this time further along the cliff and without the safety platform, in search of more burials. Well, this looks disturbingly like another grave, but this is just the sort of construction that we were looking at. Um, with those other ones, with these, with these flat slabs on top, there's, there's horizontal slabs there for the top, and this looks like a big flat slab here. This stuff looks like natural, so presumably the fill of the grave is inside there. It's got to be planned. It's got to be. It's got to be photographed and planned because, again, it's obviously eroding just out of the cliff section, and um, it could be gone fairly quickly. Katie's almost finished excavating the child's grave. I think it's going to be completely empty. Bizarre. Well, it's not really bizarre if you think this is going to be a very, very small child. And the bones are so delicate yeah. that they're very unlikely to have survived. Yeah, yeah. Can you see that um, the soil has changed now? It's um, a lot more pebbly. Yeah, yeah. So I think, and we've got also got down to the base of these stones here. Yeah, yeah. So I think basically we've got to the bottom of this grave. In a way, it's uh, I feel quite strange. Uh, we haven't found anything in the grave, in the baby grave, and um, all sorts of moral dilemmas that are going round in my head are put off until such a time as when we do find a complete skeleton. That ten centimeters, then the bottom of that is. There's a real sense of urgency now. We run in out of time and Alice needs to record her latest burial, the fifth found on the cliff face. Only then can she remove any of the bone fragments. For the first time on the cliff face, the eroding bones are not pieces of skull and vertebrae. Now that is trabecular bone. You can see the way it's made out of lots of little struts. And that's what most of the bones in your foot are like. Or well, most of the bones in your ankle anyway. I found a, a tailor, an ankle bone. Oh, that's fantastic. Is that's, this from the cliff face? Yes, it's from the, that fifth grave on the cliff face, yeah, that I've just oh. been looking at. 
Well, that's that's really interesting because if you've got the foot, then that probably means that the rest of the skeleton. It certainly looks like it. I think the... I've got the the feet um, and then some of the the outer side of the coffin, which we haven't had on any of the other ones, have we? No. We, we come down inside the exactly. inside the coffin. Um, yeah, so I've got the slabs on the outside of it. So you've got five over there. I've got four in here. Four. Meg's just four. found another one. There's four in here. Yeah, so I've got a, a little child's grave here. Yeah. An even tinier one I've just picked up to the side of it. Yeah, that's that is One tiny. running along underneath it, which I presume is an adult one. Yeah. And then one in the corner. Yeah, so it's quite a, it's, it's quite it's a substantial a, cemetery then. It's a really dense cemetery. Yeah, yeah. And also what we can tell now is because we've got um, a child burial, we're not, we're not looking at a monastic settlement. It's going to be a lay population. Yeah. I think, it's, I think it's lovely how they have taken the same care and trouble to construct the graves for the children. It suggests to me what you've got here is a family group mm -hmm. or um, generations of a um, uh, family but rather than an ascetic monastic community. And that raises the question of the relationship of this site to what's happening down on the site of the parish church at St Ishmael's, which of course, uh, uh, as we realise, is a, a major uh, class mother church uh, bishop house site. Uh, certainly in the late norm here, the 10th, 10th century, and what the relationship is, and perhaps once they stop burying here, the next generations were burying down there. Meg has come down onto the lid of another burial. To pinpoint the single burial by radar, then open a one by two metre trench and reveal a complete grave is an absolutely amazing piece of survey work. It's all fallen into place. It's starting to look like our cemetery was the precursor to St Ishmael's, which we know is 11th century. We now have enough bone fragments for carbon-14 dating, but as yet, we don't know anything about the individuals who were buried here. Time's running out and we lose in the light, but we committed to seeing this excavation through to the end. Well, it's all hands to the pump at the moment. We've got the two trenches open and we're trying to come down on top of two very prominent graves. And the delivery team and myself are all helping out under the watchful eye of both the archaeologists. Yeah, I'm really excited. I'm really excited. You know, it's the, it's the end of the day and this really is meant to be the end of the excavation. Um, as I said, we are going to have to continue tomorrow, but I'm just really excited to have a look in Meg's grave. So I'm going to go and have a look, if that's all right. The capping stones over Meg's grave are ready to be lifted. They stones off in the reverse order um, so that they were laid down when the, when the grave was created. Each stone needs to be carefully checked for inscriptions. We should probably look for inscriptions on the outside so you can flip them in and check okay. it. Okay. Ooh, it's nice. Ooh, there's, you can see these side stones in here coming straight back. The mood is definitely one of sombre anticipation. Most of the times when I'm excavating a grave it's because um, because if I didn't, then somebody's going to destroy it anyway. So I think it's, it's really important that we do excavate this because then we can show what is here, because the coast is eroding. But at the same time, um, the foresters are putting all this, these trees up right next to the archaeology to stabilise the, the coast, which is also doing damage to, to the archaeology. So, you know, if we, if we can dig this, we can say how deep the archaeology is, and in the future, people can just be very careful where they put paths, where they put trees, you know, so it's, it is, it's good, it's good to do this. As the final stones are lifted, it's clear that the grave is full of soil, with no trace of a skeleton. Got it? Uh -huh. All right. Oh, my gosh, look at that. That is amazing. Wow. You can 
see yeah, you just see the top of the skull and oh. the dome of it there. Yeah. And that's just it's fantastic. It just looks really well preserved. It's not broken. It's just just a bit strange for, for you. I mean, I, I know you've revealed skeletons quite a bit before. Mm. I mean, this is the first time I've I've ever seen a skeleton. You as well. Me really? Too. Yeah. You looking a bit sheepish, you know? Um, <laughs> Well, I, the problem is I've been getting so excited about this, and then suddenly, you know, this, this whole skull is revealed. In order to lift the skull, it's essential that we remove the final stone, but it's firmly embedded in the wall of the trench. OK, so you've got where you wanted to be, lifting the stones. What's the plan from now? We certainly can't, you know, go any further with excavating the skeleton because the next thing that needs to happen is that that stone needs to be removed. Yeah, and in order yeah. to do that, you've got to extend the trench. It means that you can then see the whole grave, you can see the grave cut, all of that sort of thing. Phil, do you think that, do you think that sounds like a reasonable plan? I don't really think we should go any further with this tonight. I think we should, I think we should leave it. I think you're right. I mean, it's going in under the section, isn't it? It is, So yeah. you, you need to widen up the the trench and uh, and best will in the world this sort of light is no it's yeah, it streams not ideal, isn't it? Is it? Yeah, so, yeah. yeah how important is it to to lift the skeleton when up? we cut into the ground here we made a commitment to seeing it all the way through the whole process and we can't just dig down to something see oh it is burial yes confirm what we think it is and then close it up because because the evidence will be lost. We'll have done something almost for nothing. Yeah. And honestly, we if, if we have issues like that, we oh. shouldn't have opened it up. Period. After 14 hours of excavation yesterday, the team are back on site early to finish what we've started. The first big surprise of the day is when we examine the newly cleaned capping stones from the grave. One of them has an inscribed cross, a very crude and possibly very early Christian symbol. I don't know about you, Katie, but this was an absolutely incredible find. Yeah. And there's, there's a wealth of geological information in this tablet, and the first thing that struck me was this line across here. Mm. And on the top half of it, there's a lot of lichen growth, and it's incredibly well weathered. It's mm. been exposed to the elements for a substantial amount of time. Whereas down below there, no lichen, and very little weathering. Yeah, you're quite right. You can see there's quite a big difference between this area and this area. It's carved a bit narrower, isn't it? And this bit is wider. So it looks to me as though this was actually once standing at the head of a grave with this bit inserted into the ground and this bit standing upright. So it actually predates our skeletons? Absolutely, it's yeah. been reused inside our grave. i tell you something else that I picked up on as well, is that, see the corners of the cross? Mm -hmm. Yeah, they're actually drilled in place and then they've probably chiselled it right the way across. So it's quite a crude method of inscribing the cross. Mm. And the other thing that we can tell from this cross, just from the design of it, is that it's probably around 6th century. With the two baby graves empty, Katie has removed the capping stones on the adult grave and is starting to find fragments of badly decomposed bone. The acid soil has almost completely destroyed the skeleton. Over in Meg's trench, the side wall has been cut back to reveal the full extent of the grave. We're just about to lift this stone over the head of the, of the burial. Are you ready, Meg? I am ready. It's too heavy, give me a shake. Are you alright? Let's stick one. There we go. The vault of the skull seems to be almost completely intact. There may be enough for Alice to determine the sex and the age of the individual. You can actually feel the mastoid process. Okay. Uh, I just put my fingertip there, so that's intact, which is good because that's. What's that, your teeth? Uh, your no, no, it's, it's just, just behind your ear. Uh -huh. You've got a, a strap like muscle that actually turns your head from side to side, that runs down your neck. That's where it detaches. Now, that's much larger in, in males than in females. And then all your neck muscles attach onto a lump on the back of your head called the external occipital protuberance. <laughs> and, uh, and that is a great jutting out thing in males. The next time you see a bloke with a shaved head, have a look at the back of his head, because yeah, yeah. you can see a sort of lump sticking out. And women don't have that. They have, a, they have a nice smooth back to their head. Katie's skull is in much worse condition, but the teeth are giving some clues to the age of the individual. You see these uh, Sorry, teeth, mate, some of them have fallen out. Look how worn they are. Cool. Yeah. Look at that. Well, this one. 
Oh, and right down, yeah. There's only so much osteoanalysis that can be done on site. The skulls and all the bone fragments are carefully packed in acid-free containers to be shipped back to Alice's bone lab. After all of the attached soil has been removed, it's immediately apparent that more than 80% of the skeletons have been destroyed in the acid soil. Fragments have been carbon-14 dated and have given us a very early medieval date of 734 AD. We also know a lot more about both individuals. So what can you tell me about the two skeletons, Alice? Well, this skeleton here is the one from the grave that Meg and I were excavating. Right. Um, and as I thought at the time, this does look like a female skull. It's got a fairly rounded frontal, not much in the way of brow ridges above the eyes. Mm -hmm. And also the back of the skull is nice and rounded with no particular bits sticking out as well. That's, that's female looking to me. OK, yeah. let's see how good you are. An age. I can't give you an accurate age on this at all. Um, all I've got is the top of the skull. Now, one of the things which does change with age are that the sutures start to close. Can you see these zigzag lines here? Mm -hmm. Which are fairly indistinct on this one, so they have closed as the person's got older. It's very variable when they close, so I'm not going to say anything more than it was an older person. It's an not older a teenager. Person. OK, an adult female then. Yeah, yeah, okay. an adult female. What about this one? This one over here, um, I can't give a sex to. I've said it's indeterminate sex because some of the features in it are male and some of the features seem to be female. Uh, it's always easier if you've got a pelvis, but we haven't on this one. But I can give you an age. OK. And I think one of the things that you were picking up on when we were excavating was that um, some of the teeth look quite worn. Yeah. This one here, um, the cusps have been completely worn off. You can see that dentine is exposed. But that's a first molar that comes through around the age of six. So that is going to be the most worn of all the molars. So if we look at the third molars, the wisdom teeth, mm -hmm. so these are the ones that come through, again, around the age of 18. It varies quite a lot. And you can see that there's no dentine exposed on that. There's a bit of polishing and the cusps have been worn down a little bit, but there's no dentine exposed. So, in fact, although that tooth is incredibly worn um, compared with teeth nowadays, this isn't a particularly old individual. It's probably right. somebody in their 20s. And why would it be so worn, though? Because of the different diet that they were eating. They were right. eating a much more abrasive diet. There's a lot more grit in the diet from quernstones used to grind up corn and things. With all of the radar data processed into a 3D cube, the extent of the cemetery has become apparent. Well, the ground penetrating radar survey gives us the evidence that we need to say this is in fact a cemetery. We had targets, we excavated them, they are burials. So now we can say the rest of the targets in the area, and there are probably 20 and possibly even more, are actually burials. This is fantastic, isn't it? Just from such a small beginning, a few bones sticking out of the cliff face, we've really pulled together so much data. We've shown that this is a Christian burial site with east-west aligned graves. It probably started around the 6th century and continued in use until about the 8th century. Um, we didn't find the church, but let's hope that someday in the future might find that. And then the population probably moved towards St Ishmael's in the 10th, 11th century. And now that I've done my assessment on the bones, and we've got the radiocarbon dates as well, the bones themselves are going to go back to St Ishmael's and get reburied. With all of the archaeology removed from the path and cliff edge, the site was restored by park rangers. If in the near future more erosion takes place, then the coastal path can be moved inland, safe in the knowledge that no more graves will be disturbed.